Hello, welcome. In today's chapter, we're going to talk about budgeting and also your own personal financial statements. These are important documents to have because whenever you are applying for a loan, uh, the, the, the bank will oftentimes look for these statements. So in this chapter, we'll actually go over step by step how to create these statements. This include the uh, personal balance sheet, which is oftentimes also called the statement of net worth and also the statement of cash flow. This is the uh, statement that documents your inflow and your outflows. Then we will develop a budget, which is obviously a very important part of financial planning, and also how these uh, statements uh, will uh, help you achieve your financial goal. So we briefly mentioned that these statements are important when you look for a loan. However, this statement is also the building block or actually the foundation of your personal financial plan. Because if you want to reach your goal, you can't really get there if you don't know where you are. So the first step towards achieving your financial goal is to look at your current situation. The reason why a lot of people don't do financial planning and don't do budgeting is because of emotions. And this is part of uh, behavioral finance, a topic that I'm very interested in. In fact, a lot of finance is common sense, uh, also sprinkled in with some calculations and math, but common sense play a long way towards financial planning. However, our human emotions, these are natural, are oftentimes are counter are counterproductive. Uh, so behavioral finance researchers find out that sometimes people are afraid to face facts. And what we need to know is that, especially if those are not good news, what we need to know is that facts don't change even if you don't look at them. So not looking at a potential challenge or a problem doesn't solve the problem. The problem remains. What we need to know is that knowledge is power. So if we don't have knowledge, we would not be able to make the necessary changes. But knowing where we are is the first step. Another common reason that people don't do financial planning is because they feel overwhelmed. Um, again, here you have to know that worrying oftentimes is harder than doing. The trick in there is to break your task into small manageable steps and then take one step at a time. And don't be overwhelmed by all the tasks and all the steps that you have to take. Just take the first step today. And so if you have trouble organizing things, we can develop a system. And this is not as hard as it sounds. So let's take a look at how we can do it. The good news is that uh, today, most of our financial records are available electronically. So it's actually much easier to find and keep our financial record uh, than in the past. So let's classify our records into different categories and that will make it a lot easier to tackle. So, so the first one uh, type of records are personal records. So these include your passport, your social security card, your birth certificate, uh, your um, employment letter. So these, you can think of these are things that you need to get a job, right? When you interview for a job, the first thing they ask you to, to provide is a form of identification. And that includes your social security card, your driver's license, um, and also a passport sometimes. <laughs> So these are paperwork record, and you should have them in a safe place that you can get to um, at a moment's notice. Uh, the other type of records are tax records, and these you only need to keep for three to six years. Uh, so these are your tax re uh, your tax return that you file. And again, today you can keep that uh, online. You can just store a PDF file. Uh, Naming your file appropriately will be very easy. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward if you just include the name, uh, your last name and the year for the tax return and the name tax return. That will make finding the file in the future very easy. Next are financial records. These include your bank statements, your credit card statements. 
Once again, most of us probably have just electronic statements, and you can. Uh, the challenge there is proactively download those statements. Uh, so as long as you download the most recent year statement, again, naming your file will make finding them later a lot easier. The next type of records are property records. So this include your house, uh, your lease agreement for your house. Um, or if you own your house, that will be your mortgage uh, agreement as well as your house title and your property tax. Uh, and then for your car, you should also have the title, again, or the loan agreement or the lease agreement. So it's a good, a good idea to keep those uh, in, uh, in paper form. Or if you prefer to store everything electronically, scan in the document. And sometimes they also send the document electronically. For major purchases, you should definitely keep the receipt for at least the uh, warranty period. Uh, this is particularly true for electronic purchases such as a cell phone or your computer in case something went, went wrong and you need to make a warranty claim. Uh, personally, that has happened to me. I have a cell phone that went back within six months and I was able to get a replacement through warranty. We'll be going over insurance later on in this uh, class, uh, but you should definitely keep the policy so that you have uh, the record in case you make it, you need to make a claim or it becomes necessary to use the insurance. And we'll also talk about estate planning and your view. Once again, those are things that you want to keep uh, both electronically and also in paper form. So just to sum up, uh, this uh, items that you should definitely keep in paper form. Uh, the other, you most likely will keep them in electronic format. So if you keep your record on a computer or electronically or online, uh, you should download the copies locally and put it in your backup file. Uh, also very important for data security, make sure that it's encrypted and is protected by password. The reason for that is anybody that has access to your social security number or bank record uh, can access your money. File name is very important. Uh, better yet, organize the files into folders that you can find them easily. For paper record, uh, if you are keeping them at home, then you should put them in a fire safe, uh, fireproof safe or, or at a safe deposit in the bank. Uh, those, are, those are records where physical copies are important. And once again, if you lose them, it can be a hassle to get them replaced. Remember, locating the information usually is the hardest, hardest step for most people. Once you have the data available, then we can arrange them in a format that is easy for us to use and provide uh, valuable information. So to do that, we'll be creating a personal balance sheet. Again, sometimes uh, we also call that a statement of net worth. So the first step is to list all the things that you own. So these, we call them assets. And we classify them into four major categories. The first are what we call liquid assets. So these are uh, things, these are uh, accounts that you can easily as access. Uh, this include, range everything from cash to your checking account to your savings account. Uh, we'll be going over uh, other more uh, sophisticated accounts such as money market or certificate of deposits. But the key thing about liquid assets is that they are almost as good as cash. The next category of assets are investment assets. So these are what we call financial assets. Um, a good example would be stocks and bonds, and it can also be your retirement account. So 401k is a retirement account. So again, we'll go over uh, these uh, specific terms. The key idea is that these are uh, longer term investments uh, and they cannot be turned into gas as readily. So in order for you to use money from your retirement account, there are a lot of restrictions. And then the third type of uh, assets are real estate. So this will be the house that you own or land. 
um, or houses if you have more than one. And then the last category are personal possessions. So these range everything from your car to furniture in your house, appliances, computers, cell phones, clothing, so everything, uh, jewelry, so everything else uh, go into uh, these personal possessions. The other thing that is important to keep in mind is when you list the value, you want to list the current market value. Uh, so this is particularly important for personal possessions. So for example, automobile is a depreciating asset. So in, you may have purchased a car for $30,000, but today your car may only be worth $10,000, $15,000. Uh, real estate can both go up and down. So again, we want to list the value of what you think you can sell it for. So step one is listing everything that you own. And then step two is listing your liability. So this is how much you owe. Uh, and this can include uh, two major categories. The first is current liability. So these are short term, uh, usually less than one year. Good examples are credit card. Uh, and then consumer credits. Consumer credits include things that you uh, appliance purchase is a good example. Uh, you may have a 12-month plan or a 6-month plan or even a 24-month plan for um, purchasing furniture, uh, electronics, and so forth. And then there are longer-term liabilities. These are typically uh, two plus years. So this will be anything from car loans, student loans, or mortgage. Mortgage are typically uh, 15 to 30 years. Car loans is three to five years. Student loan oftentimes is five to 10 years. So those are the two major steps. So your uh, assets and your liability. And then the last step is to compute your net worth. And your net worth is simply your asset minus your liabilities. To see how we create a personal statement of net worth, let's use a case. Uh, we have a couple, they are Maya and Isis. And here are their personal information. So take one minute to look at this and you may even want to jot down uh, the key data. And then we'll show you how we'll uh, arrange this into a personal statement of net worth. So the first step here, we are going to look at their uh, major assets and also their major liabilities. So this is the format that is oftentimes used to uh, create a statement of net worth. This is a common uh, format. Remember we talk about the four category of assets. So the first category is here. Uh, we list all the cash value. So for Maya and Isis, they have $200 in their, ch in their checking account and $800 in their money market account. So they have $1,000 altogether as cash. And then here are their investment accounts. So this is the second type. So these are financial investments. And they have some, they don't have any stocks or bonds. They have some mutual funds. We'll talk about what those are later on. Uh, they are a form of financial investment. And then IRA and Wolf IRA and retirement 401k, both of these, the last two are retirement related accounts. So these are all long term investments. And then finally are the uh, property. So they have real estate, so they have a house. And they also have a, uh, cars and other personal property. So altogether, these are the total asset when you add up the total. So each category has a subtotal as well. So have $200 in checking account, $800. So the subtotal for cash is $1,000. And the subtotal for investment is $19,700. And the subtotal for real estate and other assets is $537,000. So all together, so if you add up all the subtotal, you have $557,700. Next, let's look at their liabilities. So again, we have subtotals. They have credit card of $50 balance, and that's all they have. So that their subtotal short-term or current liabilities. And then their long-term liability includes an auto loan on their car, a mortgage, and other loans. So this could include student loans, uh, or consumer loans, so anything that is uh, long-term, more than two years. 
So the subtotal of that is $517,000 and $50. So when they add up the two subtotal of $50 plus the long-term total, their total liability is $517,050. So if we take their total asset, which is $557,700 minus their liability, $517,050, that will give you their net worth. So you take the total asset and then you subtract the total liability, you get a net worth of $40,650. So what that means is that they, all the property and asset that they owe, that they own, total $557,700. But because they still owe money on these assets, not all of them belongs to Maya and Isis. Uh, so only $40,650 can they be counted as theirs. So this is their net worth. One thing very important to take into account is that net worth is a picture of where they are today. So how can, how will their net worth change? They can increase their net worth by increasing their savings. So again, if they increase their saving, their net worth will go up. If they decrease their saving, their net worth will go down. Uh, another is through changes in their investments. Uh, so if the investment value go up, then the net worth will go up. So when the stock market goes up, then their net worth will go up, or the housing market goes up, their net worth will go up, uh, and vice versa. Uh, another way that network can be affected is by changing their borrowing. So if they increase their credit card balance, for example, that will reduce their net worth because now they owe more money. Something that's very important to remember is that your net worth is not money that is available for you to use. It's just an indication of where you are today financially. Another word of... Uh, note is that your net worth can actually be negative. And in fact, that is not a surprising event, particularly for younger people with more liabilities such as student loans, but has very few assets. So for example, they may have an inexpensive car, they don't have a home, but they have a fairly large student loan that will create a negative net worth. And that is just indicating where you are today. That uh, So do not be alarmed if you find that you have a negative net worth. Remember once again that the statement of net worth does not represent how much money you can use for spending. To look at that, we have to turn to the st personal statement of cash flow. Statement of cash flow records your inflow and outflow. Inflow is money you take in, so your income, and outflow are money you spend, so your expenses. Cash inflow, money that you take in, typically for most of us includes our um, income, and we distinguish gross income from your take-home pay. So your take-home pay or net pay is your gross income minus all the deduction. So take home pay or net pay is equal to your gross minus your deductions on your paycheck. So this is what shows up on your paycheck. And this could include taxes for all of us. Um, other items may include insurance premium, uh, uh, retirement, 401k contributions, uh, union deals, uh, so all the deduction that automatically comes out of your paycheck uh, will be subtracted from your net. Other income may include uh, interest, dividends, so this is money you earn on your investment. Uh, they may also include others such as gifts, or if you're a uh, student, you may get scholarship. So those are all money that you receive. We also want to record expenses. So for expenses, we want to classify them into essential versus non-essential. So essential expenses are 
basically expenses that you must have for daily living. Uh, we further classify those into fixed expenses. So fixed essential expenses will include your rent payment, uh, your utility, your insurance. So this means uh, these expenses are typically the same month after month after month. Uh, and then there are essential expenses that change from month to month or week to week. Uh, they fluctuate quite a bit uh, sometimes, and these are particularly things such as medical expenses. Uh, and then there are non-essential non expenses. Uh, these uh, typically include entertainment. So these are usually things that you do uh, for fun. But some of them may include donations, charitable don donations, or gifts for others. Your surplus or deficit is your inflow minus outflow. So your cash inflow is money that is available for you to use. So this is money you can use. And your outflow is how much you actually use it. The statement of cash flow is particularly important because it can use as the basis for creating your budget. The one of the uh, common way to create a statement of cash flow, especially if you're doing it for the first time, is to take a year end total. So you can typically download this from uh, both when you're doing taxes and also from your bank's financial statements and your credit card statements. So you can, uh, for income, it's relatively easy to obtain. Usually uh, this you can get this from your W-2, what your gross pay is and what your deductions are, and then what your net pay is. So your net pay is, uh, your take-home pay is the gross income, so in this case is $96,000 minus the deduction of $24,000 and that gives you $72,000. And once you have the annual total, you can convert into a monthly total. So simply divide that by 12 because there are 12 months per year. So if you take $96,000 and divide that by 12, you will get $8,000 per month. So the monthly total is simply the annual total divided by 12 to get monthly. For expenses, it's similar. Again, your credit card and your bank statements will be your useful uh, places of record. So you can easily gather your uh, total rent uh, from your bank account. And also, uh, if you look at your credit card, you may get your grocery bill and so forth. Another very useful tool when we are creating our statement of cash flow is to look at uh, our expenses as a percentage of total spending. So for example, we want to know how much of our spending is based uh, is in housing. So this is based on spending. So uh, to get that, we take the housing expenses, which is $31,694, divided by total spending. So total spending is our total cash outflow. So that's $71,316. And that is how we come up with 44% because that's equal to 0.44. So in this example, we also created um, subtotals. So we know the subtotal for net take home pay is 72,000. If we add the other type of expenses which we, we don't have, we get a total cash inflow. If we add up all our essential expenses, both variable and fixed, we get a subtotal essential expense of $54,945. If we add up all our non-essential expenses, we get $16,371. And if we add these two together, we add the two subtotal together, we get a total expenditure of $71,316. So here the percentage is very useful. We see that 77% of our expenditure is essential and 23% is non-essential. Now we can look at how do we do on a regular basis. So if we take our income, so $72,000 minus our expenses. So this is our inflow minus our outflow. That will give us a surplus. So we have a surplus of $685. What do we do with that money? Or what did Maya and Isis do with the money? They put 
out of the six hundred and eighty five dollars they put four hundred and sixty dollars uh, eighty dollars into their four hundred one k that's their retirement account and then the remaining two hundred and five dollars they put that into their savings account to build up their emergency fund now that we have created a statement of net worth and a statement of cash flow the next question is well how do we do how are we doing let's take a look at my analysis so they look at the spending you can look at it as a percentage of income or you can look at it as a percentage of spending to look at it as a percentage of income you divide by income if you look at it as a percentage of spending you divide it by total spending so that was the example that we saw in the last page so you can do it either way uh, the important thing is to look at how does the spending relative to your, to your income or how important how much your spending is in any particular category so for my and ISIS, uh, we saw that the biggest expenses they have is uh, housing, leisure, utilities, food, and grocery. Um, the other way to look to use the same financial cash flow is to evaluate whether or not they have sufficient emergency fund. A rule of thumb is to have three to six months of essential expenses to in your savings or money market account. So let's take a look at Maya and ISIS. So their monthly expense expenses based on their statement of cash flow is $4,579. So if we multiply this by, and you can round it up, you don't need the precise number. So you can round it up to $4,600 and you multiply that by three, that gives you approximately $14,000. If you multiply it by six, that will get you $27,000. So in other words, for them to have a sufficient emergency fund, they need somewhere between $14,000 to $27,000. Let's take a look at their savings account. What do they have? So for Meyer, their current savings account only has $800. And they, so that is much, much less than what they need. And they're also contributing only $40 a month to their 401k and hardly any money towards their savings account. So they are not going to be achieving their financial goal anytime soon. So it's not surprising that your immediate short-term goal is to rebuild their emergency fund because they don't have sufficient emergency fund and they have intermediate goal and long-term goal as well. Uh, so right now they are not really on track. There are other metrics that we can also use to uh, based on our statement of net worth and statement of cash flow to help us uh, evaluate where we are. And one of them is uh, debt to income ratio. So this is a percentage based on income. So the one way to compute this is to take your monthly loan payment divided by your gross monthly income. So for in our case for Maya and ISIS, uh, their total monthly payment is mortgage of twenty four forty one plus their auto loan plus their student loan. So their total loan payment is $2,934. Their gross income is $8,000 per month. So their DTI or debt to income ratio is 37%. Is that good or is bad? So let's take a look. So typically uh, for the financial service industry, a debt to income ratio of less than 35% is considered good. So my analysis is not bad, but they are not terrific. So they may not be able to get the lowest interest rate if they were to uh, try to obtain financing. Here's a short video that is produced by the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau by the government, and it's a very informative video. So let's take a look. 
If you're looking into buying a house, ConsumerFinance.gov can help you navigate the home buying process and understand any new financial terms you encounter along the way, like debt to income ratio or DTI. So why does a debt to income ratio matter? Your DTI is all of your monthly debt obligations divided by your gross monthly income, which is the amount of money you earn before taxes and before any deductions are taken out. This percentage is one way lenders measure your ability to manage payments you make on money you've borrowed. It may affect how much a lender will loan to you, the interest it will charge, and what you feel comfortable spending on monthly mortgage payments as part of an overall budget. Different loan products have different DTI limits and lending criteria, and the same is true for different lenders. So it's important to look at all of your mortgage options and talk to multiple lenders to choose the loan that's right for you. ConsumerFinance.gov is your go-to resource for clear answers to hundreds of financial questions. To learn more about buying a house and choosing a mortgage, check out ConsumerFinance.gov slash buying a house. Well, you have learned a lot in this video and, uh, and all the important basis for us to get started on creating a budget. We'll end the video here. When we come back, we'll go over how to use the data that you have collected and created to create your own budget. See you soon.